and that would be in some sense also the person who's recounting their autobiography, can't help but tell you what they're up to, even though they might not know. And this is something that Jung, because Jung was a Carl Jung, the psychoanalyst, was a great student of Nietzsche. And Jung came to believe that we all inhabit stories, that the stories, were, the stories we inhabit were actually the structures of value within which we live, and that those stories essentially had an ethic or a moral. And then you, you could start thinking about what the ethics and morals might be, and you kind of have some sense of that, because there's, there's comedic stories and tragic stories, and there's evil characters and good characters, and so forth, those are good characters. But part of the point that Nietzsche's attempting to make here is that the philosopher is in fact aiming at something with his life, with all of his actions, he might not even know what it is. But partly what he's doing in his attempt to philosophize is to articulate that and reveal it to himself and to other people. So then the question becomes, well, what is it that the person is up to? And I would say in some sense that's the ultimate question. And so Nietzsche here in this paragraph is also dealing with the, with the ultimate question in life, which might be, well, to what is your life aimed? And you might say, well, it's not aimed at anything. It's, it, I don't know. I, I don't seem to have any coherent set of beliefs. I don't know what I believe. I don't believe in anything, either. But that's not the case, because if you didn't believe in anything, you couldn't see. You have to believe in something to be able to see, because you point your eyes at things, and you can't organize your vision without having an aim. And so the very act of interacting with the world presupposes an ethic. And then all those micro ethics that you contain within you are organized into some sort of structure, either badly or well, and that structure roughly has an aim. And you might know it and you might not, but that doesn't mean it isn't there. So, so another thing that Nietzsche is alluding to is that you believe things whether or not you think you believe them. In fact, believing them and knowing you b believe them aren't even the same thing. And so that people believe all sorts of things that they don't know about and that partly what they're doing when they're doing philosophy is to try to figure out what those things are. You, you know, and you can also ask yourself, well, where did they come from? Well, they partly came from you, but you, you're an old thing. Your physical form is three and a half billion years old. And you're the process of all that, all the death and struggling that went along the entire course of that three and a half billion years is you carry that with you. And then on top of that, inside you is the consequence of the entire cultural history of complex life. That's all inside you too. And then on top of that, some of that's articulated more or less. Some of it's acted out, dramatized, represented in fiction and that sort of thing. And then some of it's articulated. But there's way more at the bottom than it is fully articulated. And so God only knows what you're up to. And then you might say, well, who cares? Well, I the problem with that is that you care, because first of all, that's the definition of caring, and second of all, that determines the, the, the way that you'll move through your life. And everything that happens to you that's good or evil or good or bad is going to be a consequence of the manifestation of that ethic in the world. So and now Nietzsche is saying something else, too, when he says, the moral or immoral purpose in which every... In, the moral or immoral purpose of every philosophy has constituted the true vital germ out of which the entire plant has always grown. He's saying that the philosopher can't help but reveal his aim in his writings. And then he's saying something else, which is that aim might be malevolent. And, you know, modern people aren't very comfortable with ideas like malevolence because malevolence is an idea that's related to evil. And modern people think of themselves as beyond good and evil to some degree. They don't believe in the re reality of those concepts. And of course, in, in this book, Nietzsche is also questioning our, at least our a priori presuppositions about what good and evil are. But that doesn't mean that he doesn't believe that they don't exist. That doesn't mean he doesn't believe that they don't exist. Yes, I guess that's, I guess that's right. You know, this is one of the things I've thought about when I was thinking about, when I thought about how Hitler died. You know, Hitler died. Hitler committed suicide in a bunker underneath Berlin when Europe was in flames. And so one conclusion that a psychoanalytically minded 
historian could derive from that is that's what he wanted. Right. And then that opens up an entire uh, a vast nest of snakes because one of the things that you might ask is, well, how is it that someone would desire that? First of all, could that even be desired? Is that actually something that anyone could even desire? Then you might ask, well, why is it that someone would desire that? And then the next thing you might ask is, if a human being could desire that and Hitler was a human being, then exactly what does that say about you? And you might say, well, I could never desire such a thing. But following along the train of the argument that we've been laying out, it's like, what makes you think you're a reliable judge of what it is that you're up to? So, okay, so now we've unpacked three sentences and we'll continue on with the same paragraph. Indeed, to understand how the most abstract metaphysical assertions of a philosopher have been arrived at, it is always well and wise to first ask oneself, what morality do they or does he aim at? So what the question is, what's the person up to? Well, there's an entire nest of snakes underneath that sentence, that sequence of propositions as well. And one of them is, well, what does it mean that people are up to something? What does it mean that they're aiming at something? Accordingly, I do not believe that an impulse to knowledge is the father of philosophy, but that another impulse, here as elsewhere, has only made use of knowledge and mistaken knowledge as an instrument. But whoever considers the fundamental impulses of man with a view to determining how far they may have hereafter is inspiring. So, Accordingly, I do not believe that an impulse to knowledge is the father of philosophy, but that another impulse, here as elsewhere, has only made use of knowledge and mistaken knowledge as an instrument. All right, so let's take that apart. Accordingly, I do not believe that an impulse to knowledge is the father of philosophy. So one of the claims, I suppose this would be an enlightenment claim, is that people do have a drive to knowledge and that that drive is in fact what underlies the production of such things as philosophy. But Nietzsche questions that because he's trying to bring us back to consideration of the fact that you can't separate the philosopher's mind from the philosopher's being. He's first and foremost a living creature and he's up to something. And the question is, what is it that he's up to? And so you can see the earliest manifestations in a paragraph like this of what later developed into deconstructionist thought, and the, that, that was mostly French continental philosophers who pursued that particular line of reasoning. And it, it is derived exactly from this kind of statement by Nietzsche. So, for example, someone like Derrida would say, it doesn't matter what the content of a text is. What matters is that the text can be used as a tool for power. And that whether the person who wrote the text knew it or not, that's what they were doing. And they were doing it in a way to privilege themselves above other people. And that's really, I would say, the fundamental deconstructionist claim. And it's a powerful claim. It's an utterly corrupt claim. But it's a really powerful claim, and it's related directly to the sorts of things that Nietzsche was referring to in this paragraph. What is it that the person's truly up to? Now, the problem with the deconstructionist claim is that it's an, it's an open invitation to cynicism, to thoughtless cynicism. I could just make the presupposition that whatever it is that you're telling me, you're, you, you're telling me merely to dominate, regardless of what it is that you claim to be doing. Well, the problem with that approach is that it's predicated on the implicit assumption that the only value that people actually have is the value to, is the desire to dominate. And of course, that's purely, like, that could be the case. And I also think that it's even reasonable to posit that to some degree that it is the case. But to take that from a contributing factor and to make that the highest god, 
because that's essentially what the deconstructionists are doing. Those are entirely different things. And you have to be aware of people who take a single causal element and elevate it to the stature of single comprehensive cause. You know, it's more reasonable to assume that people are complex in their motivations and that many different strands of biological and cultural motivation are in some sense primary and that what happens is that they come together to weave a kind of tapestry rather than to make the automatic assumption that you can reduce the entire set of human motivations to a single principle like that of power. Now, you know, I would say Nietzsche is also responsible to some degree for the deconstructionist claim that it's power because one of his most famous utterances was that the fundamental motivating force in life is the will to power. But he was...